Good morning. It is July 7th, 2021. This is the lecture for the math class for July 7th, 2021, covering Newton's second, third, or Newton's second and third law, as well as some energy properties. By this time, hopefully I'm not seeing how this time you guys did take your practical this day. So you've probably done well. You probably got your results. I would hope you all did well. But hey, we've still got to do math. So we're going to go through this process with you with these two different lessons. So Newton's second law of motion relates to force and its relation to the mass. Remember, the first law is the law of inertia. An object at rest tends to stay at rest. An object at motion tends to stay at motion unless acted upon by an exterior force. Let's talk about the third law, momentum, impulse, then conservation of momentum. So Newton's second law states the acceleration produced by a net force on an object is directly proportional to the magnitude of the net force is in the same direction as the net force and is inversely proportional to the mass of the object. What does that mean? Right, so when we look at the part of the hammer striking down the nail as the hammer strikes down on the nail, the nail is gonna strike back on the hammer with an equal amount of force. When you push against the wall, the wall is going to push back with an equal force so that your net force is going to equate out to be zero. Newton's second law describes the relationship among objects mass and objects acceleration and the net force of an object, right? The acceleration is equal to the net force divided by its mass, right? If the net force acting upon an object doubles, the acceleration is doubled. If the mass is doubled, the acceleration is half. Simple, just common algebraic changes around, right? So what it's literally saying here is by using consistent units such as newtons for force, kilograms for mass, and meters per second squared for acceleration, which we've used before, we get this exact equation. Acceleration is equal to the net force divided by the mass. Typically in physics, you usually see it written as force equals mass times acceleration because we tend to write the equations out in formulas that don't have divisors in them, right? But force equals mass times acceleration. Acceleration equals force divided by mass. However you want to look at it, they're similar formulas. All we're doing is just moving those variables around. So for example, if a car can accelerate at two meters per second, what acceleration can it attain if it is towing another car of equal mass, right? So it's saying if the car accelerates at two meters per second, but we double its mass, right? The acceleration is going to be halved because mass is on the bottom for part of that equation, right? I tend to use F equals MA because it's easier to do proportionally in math than it is yeah, A equals F over M. Whatever formula works for you to remember it, pick whichever you want to help you remember it. So force equals mass times acceleration. Force equals mass times acceleration. It's all about making math easier. If the force goes up, then either mass or acceleration has to go up, or both to make the equivalent equal. So if we have two times force, we can have two times mass, we can have two times acceleration. We just have to make sure that for whatever we do, equal sides of that formula come out to be the same thing, right? If we do two times one side, we have to do two times the other. If you have the amount of mass, the net force would end up being halved as well. It's kind of the way math works. So if a car has a mass of 1,000 kilograms, it is accelerating at two meters per second, what is the net force? Well, again, force equals mass times acceleration. In this case, force equals 1,000 kilograms multiplied by two meters per second squared. It would have a total of 2,000 newtons of force. So what happens if you double the mass of the car? Well, now you have 2,000 kilograms traveling at the same speed, two meters per second. You now have 4,000 newtons of force, right? What would it take to take the original 1,000 kilogram car to enact 10,000 newtons? Well, you'd have to accelerate it at 10 meters per second squared in order to get it to that acceleration. So that means these numbers are going to be proportional, meaning as you move one, others are going to move as well. It's an algebraic equation. Algebraic equations, when you have a something is equal to something, they are proportional to each other, meaning you change one side of the equation, you have to change the other side of the equation. So looking at this, how much force of thrust would be to accelerate a jet plane that weighs 30,000 kilograms in order to achieve an acceleration of 1.5 meters per second squared? So again, 
Our force is what we're looking for. We're looking at Browning Newtons. We know we have a 30,000 kilogram plane at 1.5 meters per second is what we want to get to. It's going to take 45,000 Newtons of force in order to get it up to that speed. So if that's acceleration, so first law, law of inertia, second law, relationship of force, mass, and acceleration. Newton's third law states whenever one object exerts a force on a second object, the second object exerts a force on an equal opposite direction of force, right? Third law describes the relationship between two forces. One force is an action force. The other force is called a reaction force. Neither force exists without the other. If I punch somebody in the face, their face is going to punch back into my hand. They're equal in strength, opposite in direction, and occur at the same time, so simultaneously. Newton's third law is often stated for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Taking case a point of your anatomy practical today. If you didn't study, your score probably is not going to be good. For every action not studying, or inaction at that point, there is an equal and opposite reaction, getting a negative test score. Doesn't matter what force we call the action, we call the reaction, doesn't really matter. In every interaction, forces occur in pain, in pairs. You push against the floor, floor pushes up with you against the with normal additive force. Tire, so have a car, you interact with the road, it produces car's motion. The tires push against the road, the road pushes against the tires. When you're swimming, when you push the water backwards, the water pushes you forwards. All of those are perfect examples of Newton's third law. Now the interactions do involve friction, right? And depend on friction. So if a person's trying to walk on an icy surface, like at the ice rinks down for the Vegas Golden Knights, where friction is minimal, they may not be able to exert enough force to walk on that ice because they're gonna be slipping aside and all over the place. So that means without that action force to push them forward, there is no reaction force, right? So there's no forward motion. You can see this when you get off a dock, you get off a boat and move onto a dock. As you move forward onto the dock, the, the, the boat moves backwards away from you. If it's not moored to the dock, the boat's going to push away from the dock, right? There's also the good old theory that if the dog wags his tail, the tail wags the dog, right? Um, and you can take that extremely out to the effect of the butterfly effect, where they say if a butterfly flaps its wings, some more tsunami is developed, right? So that's force in action reaction. Right? This theory states that even when something is small, it's butterflies flapping its wings, they can stir up a tornado or tsunami somewhere else, right? Throwing a stone in the ocean could theoretically cause a tsunami. These concepts lead into things like potential and perpetual motion machines, such as if you've ever seen one of these devices in like a psychiatrist or a doctor's office where you pull back on that one steel ball and it goes and bangs against that ball and that ball goes up and then it bangs back against that and then it bangs back against that and it just keeps kind of going back and forth. If there was no friction, that machine would just keep going forever, right? But there is friction, we know that. So that leads us both, second and third law lead us to momentum. We know it's harder to stop a large truck than a small car when both are moving at the same speed. If I've got an 18 wheeler traveling at 50 miles an hour and a car traveling at 50 miles an hour, I say a Kia Rio, something tiny. Uh, Toyota Yaris, I don't know, something kind like that. The truck will have more momentum than the car, and by more momentum, we mean more inertia and motion. It has more mass. An object can have a large momentum if it has a large mass, a high speed or velocity, or both. So if you have a large mass traveling at a high rate of speed, that is a recipe for disaster, right? That's why you know, when you're going down the mountains over the hills outside of town, right, there's those little off ramps. So momentum is the mass of an object multiplied by its velocity. So momentum equals mv. When direction is not an important factor, remember velocity makes speed into a vector, we just worry about mass times speed. So if you have a 2,000-pound car traveling at a certain speed, you'll be able to calculate its momentum. Moving truck has more momentum than a car moving at the same speed because the truck has more mass. Fast truck, or a fast car in this case, can have more momentum than a slower truck. So let's look at this comparison. So we have a Toyota Corolla truck here, or Toyota Corolla car, its mass is about 1,275 kilograms. 
a fully loaded Mack truck with a trailer. Its mass is about 3,600 kilograms. The truck is about 28 times heavier than the Corolla. That means the, for the Corolla to have the same momentum as that truck, it would have to travel 28 times faster than the truck. So in that case, a truck traveling at one mile an hour would have the same momentum as a Corolla traveling at 28 miles per hour. A truck rolling down the hill has more momentum than a roller skate with the same speed, obviously, right? But if the truck is at rest and the roller skate is moving, that roller skate has more momentum because it is actually moving. So how do we change momentum? Well, the theory of changing momentum in physics is by imparting an impulse on an object. If the momentum of an object changes, either the mass or the velocity or both changes. The greater the force acting upon that object, the greater the change in velocity and the greater the change in its momentum. The change in momentum depends upon the force that acts upon it, how long, right? If you're trying to push a car out of mud and you just walk up and go, eh, not necessarily gonna impart enough force in order to get that car stuck out of mud. But if you push consistently on it for a long period of time, you may be able to get that vehicle unstuck. A force sustained for a long time produces more change in momentum than does the same force by briefly. Both force and time are important changing an object's momentum, right? Applying a force over a longer time is gonna change the momentum faster. So the quantity of force times time is called an impulse. That's how much force we're applying over a long period of time. The greater the impulse exerted on something, the greater the change is momentum, right? Impulse equals change in momentum. So force times time equals change in mass and velocity, right? That delta means change in. To increase the momentum of an object, apply a great force for a long period of time. Makes sense, right? Same thing happens in your engine. To speed your engine up, you can either use your gas for a short period of time and it takes off and slows down again, or you can apply that same amount of force for a long period of time, squeal your tires and tear down the road. For example, a golfer teeing off and a baseball player trying for a home run both do the same things. They're gonna swing their perspective tool, whether it's the golf club or the bat, hard as possible, and try to follow through with their swing. And what follow through means is maintain contact with that ball, whether it's the baseball or the golf ball, for as long as possible to impart as much momentum on that object so it flies as far as possible. I know very little about either baseball or golf, but I know about the physics of both. The forces involved in impulses usually vary from instant to instant. A golf club that strikes a golf ball exerts zero force in the ball until it meets it. So if I'm swinging that golf club and I never hit that golf ball, I've never imparted a momentum on that golf club or that golf ball, right? But as I strike that golf ball, the ball is going to rapidly become distorted. The force diminishes, the ball comes up to speed and returns to its original shape and then flies off use the average force to solve for the impulse of an object. So here's kind of what it looks like if you're looking at it at a high-speed camera, right? So here that club's coming in contact with the, the ball, right? And you can see the distortion of the ball. And then as that ball comes up to speed, the ball returns to its original shape. The more force we can impart upon an object, the more momentum it's going to have. So if you're in a car that was out of control and you had to choose between hitting a haystack or hitting a concrete wall, why would you choose the haystack? Well, most people think, oh, well, it's because it's softer. Yes, but physics helps you understand why hitting that soft object is different than hitting a hard one. Because your change in momentum is going to occur over a greater time. Your slowdown is going to occur over a longer time versus hitting that wall and kind of getting that one sudden stop. So therefore, if the force of that momentum changing over time is longer, right, the force of the impact is less, you're not going to have as much structural damage to yourself or the car if you strike something soft as you do hard. 
when hitting either the wall or the haystack coming to stop, the decrease is going to be the same. You're going from 50 to zero miles per hour. Change is going to be the same. Just depends upon how long it takes you to get there, right? The same impulse change going from 60 to zero doesn't always mean the same amount of force or the same amount of time. It means the same product of force and time. To keep the forces small, we extend the time. To increase the forces, we shorten the time. Either way, we look at that. So if you think about large track trailer trucks, we talked about a go, right? Going down the pass to going to California. The pass is about 1,100 meters high, or 1,100, not feet, meters, 1,100 meters high on average. And the grade is about 2.5 to 3%, meaning it's, you know, it's, a, it's kind of steady slope going down. What happens if a tractor trailer truck all of a sudden loses brakes, right? And now you add the incline to 3,600 kilograms of force. Well, you have a disaster waiting to happen. So how do you fix that? Well, you could put concrete walls up everywhere down the thing that trucks could hit. But if those trucks hit those concrete walls, number one, it's going to do a ton of damage to those concrete walls. Number two, it's going to do a ton of damage to that truck. And that's going to destroy the load, stuff like that. So what you can do is make a way for the truck to slow down slowly. And that maybe doesn't involve using cars to ping pong and decrease their force off, right? So they develop those runaway truck ramps that you'll see, right? So go down over the pass next time that you're driving to California and watch where it says runaway truck ramp. What that does is a ramp to kind of go up and it's usually kind of bunny hopped. And the idea is to slow down that force over a long period of time in order to reduce the overall force that's required by increasing the time. So when you extend the time, you reduce the force. A padded dashboard in a car is safer than a rigid metal one. I always think about this, like when I grew up, all our cars were pretty much steel. I don't know how we survived car accidents, right? Well, we didn't have as much force either. I mean, cars did travel fast, but not as fast as it is more common today, right? That's why airbags save lives. Airbags are going to slow down the force of your head coming forward Seatbelts, same thing. They slow down you moving forward. So if you climb up to the top of Pima and you jump down, you're going to bend your knees as you land. Why do you bend your knees as you land? Because you're trying to disperse that force over a longer period of time. If you jump down with straight legs, you might drive your femurs through your acetabulum and end up with all kinds of problems with broken hips, right? Any of you that watch wrestling, professional wrestling, right? And you watch them get thrown all over the mat and you're going, man, how do they survive? What they do is they extend their time of hitting the mat by spreading the impulse into a bunch of smaller impacts as they come down, right? So you see them, they'll smack their arm down, their body, they roll, right? And they successively slow down that amount of time or actually increase the amount of time, right? Slow it down that it takes for them to hit that mat. Therefore, you just therefore reducing the force they're feeling. So, you know, same idea, right? If you were, if you had to pick and you had to either jump off of a 20 foot jump drop or roll down a set of stairs or well, rolling down a set of stairs is going to actually slow you down faster or slow you down over a greater period of time, less chance of injuring your body. Right, so anything you can do to lessen that force overall affects you. So in the martial arts, they train you to roll with the blows to reduce impact. So if somebody's punching at me and I know I'm going to take the force of the punch, I'm going to roll with that punch and extend the time or ride out that punch so that the force is applied over a greater time period. Therefore, it feels lessened, right? Called rolling or riding the punch. You could also quickly close the distance, shorten the distance to the person, and therefore decrease the velocity of the punch before it even starts, as well to decrease the force, right? That's a different type of technique where I can move in quick. And by moving in quick, I reduce the amount of generation he had, or distance he has to generate force, and therefore I can decrease my force. Or I could do both, where I move in really quick and roll with the blow, and if I do both of those, it hopefully lessens the blow that it doesn't affect me as much. So if a boxer can ride or make contact with the punch 
five times longer by riding it, how much force will the punch be reduced by? Well, since the time increases by five times, the impact's reduced by five times. Remember, force, time. So they can actually reduce it because he's able to ride out that punch longer. Uh, breaking bricks in the martial arts, breaking boards in the martial arts is a common test to achieve different ranks. When a practitioner imparts a large impulse to the bricks in a short period of time, it creates considerable force. Their hand bounces back, yielding as much as twice the impulse of the bricks. Right? So that's another way of looking at this force. A glass dish, right? If I toss a glass dish right now, it's more likely to survive it's dropped on carpet than the sidewalk. Why? The carpet has more give. The time it lands is going to be extended. Therefore, the force is going to be reduced. Shorter the time, hitting the sidewalk results in a greater stopping force. Safety nets used by circus workers. Great example of this, right? Flying Grayson's from Batman. As they fell off of their trapezes and landed down in the nets, the nets kind of slow down their force, right? And allow them to ride that impact out over a longer period of time. Same thing if you're jumping out of a burning building and they have to break out one of those inflatables. Same idea there. So suppose you catch a falling pot with your hands, right? So that pot falls and you catch it with your hands. You provide an impulse to reduce this momentum to zero. So when I catch this, whoop, that wasn't a very good example. When I catch this ball, right, I'm gonna pretend this is a pot. I am going to impart a force to stop the ball or the pot, right? If I throw the ball back up, I've got to impart another impulse onto it in order to get it to go. The impulse to require to bring an object to a stop and then throw it back up again is greater than the impulse required to meanly bring it back to a stop. Meaning if I catch it, stop it, and then throw it back up, there's greater impulse there than just catching it and stopping it. Makes sense. Got to impart forces both ways. So if a flower pot falls from a shelf onto your head, you may be into great trouble, right? It's probably going to give you a good noggin shot. But if it bounces from your head, you may be in more serious because the impulses are greater when an object bounces, right? It increases the impulse by bouncing and coming back and hitting your head again. So it's going to cause a second impulse. Force or an impulse that changes momentum must be exerted on the object by something outside the object, right? Molecular forces within a basketball have no effect on the momentum of the basketball, right? Basketball is filled with air. There's air moving around inside that basketball doesn't change how fast it is, right? Definitely didn't help the 76ers at all. A push against the dashboard from inside the car is not gonna speed up the car. Makes sense, right? These are internal forces. They come in balanced pairs to cancel the object. Again, I push against the dashboard, the dashboard pushes back against me, and that force is zero. The law of conservation of momentum states that in an absence of an external force, the momentum of a system remains unchanged. Sounds kind of like the law of inertia, right? If an object doesn't have an exterior force applied upon it, its inertia state doesn't change. Kind of same idea here with conservation of momentum. So as this canum is just sitting here, right? Its momentum is zero, it's not moving. Because the momentum afterwards, when it fires, is still zero because it's imparted its momentum on the cannonball and has moved back slightly, the still net of the momentum is going to be zero because it's imparted some of its force on the cannonball itself. As the cannonball shoots forward, pew, and goes that way, the cannon actually goes back that way. That's why I have these legs here in these cannons is to keep that cannon from shooting way back, right? If this leg wasn't here and this was just a cannon sitting on a wheel, as that cannonball shot, it would go flying backwards off the edge of the screen. There's a reason why those cannon legs exist. The force on the cannonball inside the cannon barrel is equal and opposite to the force causing the cannon to recoil or go backwards. The action and reaction forces are internal to the system, so they don't change the momentum of the system, right? Before firing, the momentum is zero. After firing, the net momentum is zero. Net momentum is neither created nor, so created, gained, or lost. It just changed form at that point. It changed form by moving the cannonball forward. 
If you've ever fired a gun, whether handgun or rifle, same idea happens there. When the bullet leaves the chamber, all right, leaves or leaves the actual barrel, sorry, there's going to be a force pushed back on that gun because it's going to be equal and opposite force. There are ways to mitigate that force to make it a little bit more bearable, right? You can have thicker shoulder pads on the gun. You can learn to roll with the gun as it kind of fires off. Hopefully, you don't roll right into your forehead. Um, there are techniques you can learn of having full lock on your arms where your arms absorb most of that force. There are different techniques to modify the gun to disperse that force over the air versus coming back at you. There are all kinds of ways to lessen that force, but it doesn't change the fact that when you shoot a gun, the bullet's going to shoot out and the gun is going to shoot back. You just have to change the way that force is applied in order to maintain this idea of conservation of momentum. So that means momentum has both direction and magnitude. It is a vector quantity. As the cannonball gains momentum, the recoiling cannon gains momentum in the opposite direction. The net cannonball, cannonball, cannon, cannonball system gains none. It just imparts it in different ways. Right? The cannonball and the cannon are equal in magnitude and opposite direction. If the cannonball shoots four to two meters per second, the cannon is going to shoot back at 10, 10 meters, two meters per second. That means there's no net force acting on the system, no impulse. If that cannon were to blow up, that could change things. But even if that cannon completely blew up, the net momentum or conservation momentum of the system would just say that the parts that are blowing outwards are going to be equal to the parts that it had at that point, right? Momentum of a system cannot change unless acted upon by an external force. If we increase the gunpowder inside the cannon, then we can change the momentum because we've now changed the force acting upon the ball, right? When a quantity in a physics scenario does not change, we say that it is conserved. So law of conservation momentum describes the momentum of a system. If a system undergoes changes wherein all forces are internal, the net momentum of the system before and after the event is the same, right? So when we have atomic nuclei undergoing radioactive decay, the energy just changes form. Cars colliding, they bang together and bang back across from each other, right? Momentum's conserved. Stars exploding, um, billiard balls bouncing off with each other are examples of conservation of momentum. So whenever an object collides in the absence of external forces, such as friction, the net momentum of the object before the collision equals the net momentum after the collision. So the collision of objects clearly shows the conservation of momentum. When a moving billiard ball collides head on head with a ball at rest, the first ball will come to rest and the second ball moves away with a velocity equal to the initial velocity of the first ball. So if I strike the cue ball and the cue ball goes and hits the eight ball, Typically, the cue ball is going to sit still. The eight ball is going to continue moving at the same speed. If that cue ball doesn't sit still and maybe goes off in a different direction, then it's not going to impart the full force on whatever that other ball is. Net momentum stays the same. It's just that it hasn't completely imparted all its force on that other ball. So when objects collide without being permanently deformed and without generating heat, we say that the collision is elastic. Colliding objects bounce perfectly in elastic collisions. It's pretty rare that happens because we know that objects deform, right? If I impact my hand here with this ball, even this ball and my hand are going to deform as it happens. It's not a perfect elastic collision, right? But when collisions occur, the sum of momentum before is sum of momentum after. So here we have a moving ball striking a ball at rest, right? As those balls collide head on, so this ball's flying along, bam, it strikes that ball. This ball stops, doesn't move. Now this ball is moving. So if we say this is moving at one meter per second squared, eventually it's gonna strike this ball over here. It will now be moving at zero meters per second squared, but this ball, as long as ball is the same size, mass is the same, will now be traveling at one meter per second squared, one. Right? If the balls are different weights or different masses, that could affect how momentum is affected. The net amount of momentum is not going to change, but just maybe the level of it will. 
if they're going in opposite directions, those balls are coming crashing together. They will strike together and shoot back off in equal and opposite directions of force. If I have one ball that's already rolling and I strike it with another ball that's moving faster, afterwards, the second ball will gain the speed of that ball that was actually moving forwards, right? And the original ball that I struck with will slow down slightly. It's all kinds of cool ways to do pool, right? I don't understand pool very much, but I know that I've watched some fancy shots go on when I'm doing it, right? So a collision where the colliding objects become distorted and generate heat during collision is called an inelastic collision. Your cars colliding would be inelastic because the metal is going to bend and break to reduce the overall effects of force. Even in inelastic collisions, momentum conservation is held there. When two cars collide together, they may not bounce apart at 50 miles per hour, right? They may collide and crumble together. But what happens is that change in force that we've lost becomes heat, right? When they become tangled or coupled together, a totally inelastic collision occurs. So here we have two freight cars, right? First freight car, the orange one is traveling at zero meters per second. The first one's traveling at four meters per second. As they collide, boom, and say they're the same mass. We're gonna say that they're the same mass at this point. When they collide, they're gonna move off together at an equal collision speed, even though there's gonna be some deformation going on, the speed's gonna slow down. Because the mass has been increased, they're now gonna travel off at two meters per second because there's now two vehicles moving that have absorbed that momentum. So at that point, the initial momentum is shared by both cars. There's no gain or loss, right? Momentum is conserved. Were they gonna travel off perfectly at two meters per second? No, probably not because there's gonna be some friction heat loss, right? Momentum is always conserved in these collisions. External forces are usually negligible during the collision, so the net momentum doesn't change during the collision. External forces may have effect after the collision, right? Billiard balls encounter friction on the table in the air. After the collision of two trucks, the combined wreck slides along the pavement and friction decreases the momentum. If two space vehicles docking in orbit have the same net momentum just before and after the contact, since there is no resistance in space, the combined momentum is changed only by gravity, right? So you can overcome some of that rotation by gravity, right? This is why when, if you ever get to see a space, the space station docking with the spaceship, the spaceship has to match the velocity and rotation of the ISS, or when they collide, bad things could happen, right? If the spaceship's traveling faster than the ISS, it's gonna impart speed on the ISS and change its vector. If the spaceship traveling slower than the ISS, well, then the ISS is going to impart a certain amount of momentum on that spaceship and could rip off the docking couple. So perfectly elastic collisions are not common in the everyday world. If I drop a ball right now from this and hits the floor, it's not going to immediately bounce up at the same height. Well, why is that? Well, because there's friction. If you're able to watch on a thermal camera, the ball would impart a little bit of heat on the floor and the ball itself would gain a little bit of heat. So some of that momentum is gonna be lost to heat. And it's gonna be kind of lost there. It's not, it's not lost as in gone, it's just converted to a different form. At the microscopic level though, perfectly elastic collisions are commonplace, right? So when electronically part charged particles bounce off one another without generating heat, then there is that, right? And especially when you're looking at something like a proton and electron, because they never truly touch because of the repulsive forces. As they're traveling around each other, right? They kind of bounce off each other. So electrons come near each other, right? And they impart force, they're gonna repel each other because they're like forces. Meanwhile, that proton sitting in the nucleus holding everything together. So if we have a six kilogram fish that swims towards and swallows two kilogram fish, and that larger fish swims at one meter per second, what's the immediately velocity after lunch? Well, if we conserve momentum, right, from the instant before lunch to the instant after, then we know that the mass times the velocity has to be equal both times. So initially we've got a net momentum before lunch, net momentum after lunch, mass and velocity. We know that before 
we have a six kilogram fish traveling at one meter per second and a two kilogram fish traveling at zero meters per second. Okay, so we add those together and now we know that we have that. So we know at the end, we're gonna have a basically eight kilogram fish traveling at some speed afterwards. We do the math, calculate it out. Well, because we've lost some of that momentum, and I say lost in a metaphorical term, not in a true term, momentum is gonna be changed because the mass of the fish is getting bigger. I eat two kilo, an extra two kilograms, I've gained weight. It's harder for me to move at the same speed. Right? If your truck suddenly gains five people in it or your car, it's harder for that car to move at the same speed that you would normally do without providing with a little bit more gas or a little bit more energy. So in this case, before fish is traveling one meter per second, because now I've added two more kilograms, well, now it's only traveling at three quarters of a meter per second or 0.75 meters per second. So momentum vectors are used when looking at interaction of objects, especially in collisions and um, car accident scenes and stuff like that when cops look at this. It helps them determine who's at fault for a car accident, right? And they can usually tell that by the vector sum of the momentums. They can tell who's traveling faster, who has a heavier car by basically doing some really simple math. So if we have two cars colliding, one heading north and one heading east, as they collide, the vector that's going to allow them to travel off, they're eventually going to collide and kind of travel off to this northeast pattern. We can tell who was traveling faster. If they're traveling the same speed and they have the same mass, they're going to travel off at a perfect distance. If mass or velocity is different, then that angle is going to skew based upon the velocity and mass effect, right? So the overall momentum of that vehicle. So if the momentum of car A is directed due east and the momentum of car B is directed due north, their momenta are equal in magnitude if they're equal in weight, then the square root of two is going to be the direction they're going to go, kind of at that angle. You don't have to specifically know that. What you do have to know is that is used when we have two things colliding, right, at a kind of perfect right angle, they're going to travel off at a 45 for the most part, as long as they're equal in force in that. So again, back to the review of laws. Newton's first law is the law of inertia. Object at rest tends to stay at rest, an object in motion tends to stay in motion, unless acted upon by another force. Newton's second law, net force acts upon an object, the object will accelerate. The acceleration is directly proportional to the net force and inversely proportional to mass. Force equals mass times acceleration. And then Newton's third law says, the law of action and reaction, when an object exerts a force on a second object, the second object exerts an equal and opposite force on the first. So in PT, we'll use a variety of techniques to reduce the effect of friction because friction is an enemy in PT. It can lead to pressure injuries. It can lead to skin tears. So one of the examples we use for this is a sliding board with a transfer, right? Where we're gonna use that board, which is nice and smooth, to help move the patient from one place to another. It also saves us from having to lift the patient, right? We can control a greater mass patient, right? While moving them from place to place. Rebounders, another concept that we use this, right? Where we may take a medicine ball or a ball and we'll throw it at, it looks like a trampoline. And as that ball hits that trampoline, it'll bounce back. And now the patient has to catch that ball as it returns, right? So the rebounder itself is meant by the person's ability to catch and stop the ball. The force needed to decrease the momentum is a useful challenge to both upper extremity strength and whole body balance control. If I've got a very heavy ball and I'm throwing it double hand overhead, it requires pretty significant strength to catch it on its comeback and keep myself from losing my balance. So rebounders are a great example of that force, kind of I part of force it imparts a force upon me. Please review the assessment questions for this one. We're gonna move on to the next uh, lesson here, which is gonna be talking about energy. So let me bring that one up real quick. So the next lesson we're gonna talk about is energy. And energy ties back to this because we're gonna find out there is a law of conservation of energy as well as law of conservation of momentum. So with energy, we're going to talk about work 
power, different types of mechanical energy, potential and kinetic. We're gonna talk about the work energy theorem. And we're gonna talk about different laws that apply to those and energy for life and sources of all our energy. So energy may be the most familiar concept to everyone in science, but it's the most difficult to define. We observe the effects of energy when something is happening, only when energy is transferred from one to another, right? Right now I've got a light on my, uh, on my office here, closet, I almost said closet. I can observe the energy, right? The electricity being converted to light to illuminate my office. During physical therapy, we use multiple different forms of energy and cellular use of energy or energy that we use internally to exercise, right? So when I say work, what's the first thing you think of? Well, it's nine to five, 11 to seven, the grinding in and out, right? The place you go that isn't fun, right? It's your J-O-B, just over broke, right? It's the place you go. Well, really work itself is done when a net force acts upon an object and moves it in the direction of the net force. So work is the product of a force on an object and the distance with the object is moved. So the quantity is force times distance. So therefore we lift a load against Earth's gravity, the heavier the load, the higher we lift it, the more work we do. If the force is constant and the motion takes place in a straight line in the direction of force work done, or the, in the direction of force, the work done on an object by net force is the product of the force in the distance. So work, equals force, the net force, times the distance of an object. So here, right, if I lift this object up and I exert a certain force against this object, right, and I lift it a certain distance, I can calculate it. That would give me my work. So if we lift two loads, we do twice as much work as lifting, right? We lift same, one load the same distance. So if I double the amount of weight I'm lifting, I'm doubling the amount of work I'm doing because the force needed is twice as great. If we lift one load twice as far, we still do twice as much work because we've increased the distance we're lifting an object. So if you're at the gym and you lift the barbell, get your sole on, work is done lifting the barbell. If you lift twice as high, you do twice as much work. If you lift twice as much, you equally do twice as much work. So therefore that holds true for that work theory here, theorem here. Remember that work equals force times distance. And if we know that force is mass times acceleration, therefore we know that work equals mass times acceleration times distance, or work equals mass. So work really does make us mad. Just saying. So when you lift a barbell, you're doing work. But when you're holding it above your head, you're doing no longer work you're no longer doing work in the physics sense because you're not changing its distance. But why do you get exhausted holding it up there? Well, there is some work being done at the cellular level, right? Or even in the macrocellular level, right? When we're holding it up there, we're not doing work on the barbell, but our muscles themselves are doing micro contractions, right? It's being done on your sarcomeres, your actin, your myosin, right? And I know you probably didn't think that A and P was gonna come back into physics, but it does, right? They are all tied together. So some work is done against another force, right? If I, Archer draws, stretches back the, her bowstring, she's doing work against the elastic force of the bow. When the ram of a pile driver is raised, right? Work is required to raise that ram up against the force of gravity. And then when it drops down, it's going to do additional work. When you do a push up, you do work against your own weight. When you do a pull up, you do work against your own weight. Some work is done to change the speed of an object. Bringing an automobile up to speed or slowing it down involves work, right? Mass times acceleration times the distance. In both cases, work involves a transfer of energy between something and its surroundings, and it's specifically in distance. The unit of measurement for work combines with the unit of force with the unit of distance, meters. So Newton times force is work is then measured in the Newton meter, also called the joule. One joule of work is done when you lift one Newton over one meter, such as lifting an apple over your head. Larger units are required to do greater amounts of work. Kilojoules are thousands of joules, right? A weightlifter does work on orders of kilojoules. 
megajoules or millions of joules, right? To stop a loaded tractor trailer truck going 100 kilometers per hour requires megajoules of work. So let's say you're lifting, you're moving a 60 Newton horizontal force, right? You apply a 60 Newton horizontal force to a 30 kilogram package, which pushes it four meters across the mailroom floor. Well, how much work do you do on the package? Well, you know you apply a force of 60 Newtons and you push it four, new, four meters. Now, that 30 kilogram package, not really that important at this point. We're not talking about that. We're not lifting it straight up. We're just moving and pushing it across the floor. You've applied a 60 Newton force over four meters. So 60 Newtons times four meters would then work out to be 240 Newton meters or 240 joules of work done. So work then relates to power. And power is the amount of work done divided by the time it takes to do it. So when carrying a load up some stairs, you do the same amount of work whether you walk or run up the stairs, right? But power is the rate at which work is done. When you run up, it takes you less time. So you might do more work because it takes you less time, right? Versus walking up and taking it slower. So a high power engine does work more rapidly. An engine that delivers twice the power of another engine does not necessarily produce twice the amount of work or go twice as fast. Twice the power means the engine can do twice the work in the same amount of time or the same amount of work in half the amount of time. So a powerful engine can automobile up to a given speed in less time than a, power, a less powerful engine is, right? So an engine on something like a Lambo, Lamborghini, can get a vehicle up to speed a lot faster than something maybe in a Peugeot. So we know that power is work done over a time interval. And we know that work is force times distance, right? Or we also know that force is mass times acceleration, right? So therefore we also can say that power is equal to mass times acceleration over time. So being mad over time is really talking about power. Hope that made somebody smile. So the unit of power is a joule per second known as the watt. So what's it called again? Well, it's called the watt. Why do you keep asking? Well, what's it called? It's a watt. No, no, I know. What's it called? No. Uh, anyway, one watt of power is expended when one joule of work is done in one second. One kilowatt equals 1,000 watts. One megawatt equals 1 million watts, right? The three main engines of the space shuttle can produce, develop 33,000 megawatts of power when fuel is burned at an enormous rate of 34 kilograms per second. That is why it can allow the space shuttle to actually leave Earth's orbit and bypass Earth's gravity, right? In the United States, we customarily rate our engines in units of horsepower and electricity in kilowatts being used. But either may be used. We can actually rate cars on the kilowatt system. In the metric system, automobiles are related in the kilowatts, right? So one horsepower is about the same as 0.75 kilowatts. So an engine rated at about 134 horsepower is really a 100 kilowatt engine. The fastest production car today is Bugatti Veyron. It puts out about 1,200 horsepower. So what is the approximate kilowatt of that engine? Well, we know that one horsepower equals 0.75 kilowatts. So 1,200 horsepower times 0.75 kilowatts means that's about a 900 kilowatt engine. Compare that to the space shuttle that was doing you know, 33,000 million watts, megawatts, right? So what would a car with double the horsepower of another car indicate? Well, does it automatically mean it's faster? Not necessarily, right? It could mean it's faster. It could also mean that it's able to do more work or do more work faster, right? A car with a truck with greater horsepower may be able to move a greater load than a truck with less horsepower. If a forklift is replaced with a new fork with lift that has twice the amount of power, how much of a greater load can it lift in the same amount of time? What well, can lift twice the amount of load in the same amount of time or the same amount in half the time? 
because again, they're proportional. So that leads us to the term, where we've talked about work, we've talked about power, and now we're gonna talk about energy. And the two main forms of mechanical energy are kinetic, meaning energy in motion, and potential, stored energy. So when the work is being done by an archer and drawing back the bowstring, the bent bow is gonna acquire the ability to work on the arrow. When work is done to raise the heavy ram of pile driver, right, work is done against gravity. When work is done to sprint, wind a spring mechanism, such as like on a clock or one of those little wind up cars, right? The spring requires the ability to do work on various gears to run the clock, ring a bell, sound an alarm, or push a little, one of those little wind up cars down the road. So something has been acquired that enables the object to do work. It may be in the form of compression of atoms, uh, physical separation of attaching bodies, or rearranging the electric charge in the molecules of the substance. The property of an object or system that enables it to do work is energy. Like work, energy is measured in joules. So we're gonna measure energy in joules. Mechanical energy is the energy due to the position of something or the movement of something, right? So whether it's due to where it's at or whether it's moving. So when we talk about potential energy or what I like to call stored energy, the three types of potential energy are elastic, chemical and gravitational, right? So gravitation will be an object storing energy by virtue of its position. If I hold this here in the air, this ball has a certain amount of gravitational energy. As soon as I would let it go, it would fall, right? Energy is stored and held in readiness is called potential energy. We all have potential energy, right? Some of us have more, some of us have less. And usually by the end of the day, you have a little bit less potential energy because you're starting to get tired. It's the potential for doing work. So elastic potential energy is a stretched or compressed spring, a bowstring, something like that. That is where you store potential energy based upon the elasticity or the ability of an object to return to its original shape and impart energy on something else. That is elastic potential energy, rubber bands. Chemical potential energy is in fuels. Right? When you consume food, food, it provides you with a certain amount of chemical energy, the sugars, right? It's also the energy of position at some microscopic level, right? Because there is certain amounts of stuff going on at the electronic charge of those atoms. But in reality, it's typically fuels, right? And then gravitational potential energy is the ability for an object to be off the ground. Elevated positions increase its gravitational potential energy. So the higher an object is, the greater the gravitational potential energy. So take something like the um, Hoover Dam down the road, right? There's the reservoir of Lake Mead and then where the water drops out at below. Water in the elevated reservoir, right? Falls down and that's going to create, show that it has gravitational potential energy. Raised arm and pile driver have gravitational potential energy. The amount of gravitational potential energy and energy possessed by an object is equal to the work done to overcome gravity on it, right? So if we wanted to know how much potential gravity energy, gravitational energy an object has, we can say that potential energy equals the mass times the gravitational constant times its height. So if I have a one kilogram object, and I lift it against gravity, 10 meters per second squared, and I raise it by one meter, I can actually calculate how much gravitational potential energy, how many joules that object has. The height is at, as a chosen reference level, such as I could relate that to the desk here. It has a certain potential energy, right? But in relation to the floor, now it has a different potential gravitational energy because there's a greater height. Right? And then if I would compare that to you know, the stratosphere, that would be a different gravitational potential energy because you're a lot higher. So it depends upon you know, that height specifically, right? It's relative to that level and depends only on mass, gravitational pull, and H. So let's look at an example here, right? So we have a boulder that is two meters up in the air, right? 
And at this point, it says that the potential energy of the boulder, 100 Newton boulder with respect to the ground below is 200 joules, no matter what it is, whether it's rolled up this ramp, moved up the stairs, or just lifted straight up that two meters. Doesn't matter because now that boulder is two meters higher than it was before. Doesn't matter how much work was done to get it there. It now has a potential energy of about 200 joules. So if you were to push that boulder off that edge, it would strike the ground and deliver about 200 joules of force. So if you lift 100 Newton boulder, one meter, how much work is done on the boulder? Well, work equals force 100 Newtons times one meter, one equals 100 joules. What is the power expended if you lift that boulder in a time of two seconds? Well, it takes you two seconds. You take that 100 joules, divide it by two, took you 50 watts to get it. But what would be the gravitational potential energy of that boulder? Well, relative to its starting position, right? It started at zero, it's now one meter above, it's still 100 Newton boulder, right? So that means it's 100 joules. Relative to some other reference level, the potential energy could be different. If it's relative to, I don't know, sea level, maybe now that boulder is 500 meters up in the air. Well, now that potential energy is different. That's why it's important to indicate what that reference is in regards to. It can't just say that, you know, you have to have a specific frame of reference when you're looking at an object and talking about gravitational potential energy. So hydroelectric power stations used gravitational potential energy. Large chunk of our power here in Nevada, it comes from the Hoover Dam. So the water flows from the upper reservoir, a long tunnel down to an electric generator and spins a propeller, right? The gravitational potential energy of that water is converted into kinetic energy, electrical energy, right? As it flows downhill. So the power stations buy electricity at night when there's much less demand right? Use a little bit of that electricity to pump more water back up into the reservoir so that there's a return of fluid coming back down. It's a process called pump storage. The pump storage helps us smooth out the difference between energy and supply demand, right? At the end of the night, right now, it's pretty late at night, the energy levels in Las Vegas are less than they are during the day when it's really hot. So they have to make sure there's a, enough water to provide the energy levels that we're going to need to keep the city functional. Eventually, we could be in trouble because there may not be enough water in that reservoir to provide electricity here for the city, and then we're going to be in a whole world of hurt. So if that's potential energy, let's talk about kinetic energy. Kinetic energy of a moving object is equal to the work required to bring its speed from rest, or the work for an object to be done to brought to rest, to bring it to rest. So either to move it or stop it. So kinetic energy is equal to one half times its mass times its speed squared. So it's equal to the work required to bring it to speed from rest or the work to bring it to rest. If an object is moving, then it is capable of doing work, having energy of motion or kinetic energy, right? Kinetic energy of an object depends upon the mass of the object as well as its speed. It is equal again to half of its mass multiplied the square of the speed. So understanding the distinction between momentum and kinetic energy is by far high level physics. We're not gonna get in there, okay? So don't totally freak out about that. But if I throw a ball, right? You do work, I do work on it. So I just sent my ball flying over here. That's great, so I'm using it as an example here. So if I throw this ball, right? I'm giving it speed as it leaves its hands. If I throw it and hit something with it, right? It's going to do work on whatever it hits, right? Be aware that in this formula with kinetic energy, speed is squared. So if the speed of an object is doubled, if I can throw the ball twice as fast, the kinetic energy is actually quadrupled, right? That should be two raised to the two power. I don't know why I haven't fixed that yet. I've got to fix that. So two raised to the second power, right? Which equals four. It takes four times the work to do double the speed. So an object moving twice as fast takes nearly four times as much work to stop. So if your car is traveling at 25 miles an hour versus 50 miles an hour, it requires 
four times as much work to stop that car at 50 miles an hour than it does at 25, right? Which is why roads have certain speed requirements, right? So that you know that you have enough speed or enough distance to stop if you should start coming towards an accident. So the work energy theorem states that whenever work is done, energy changes. To increase the kinetic energy of an object, work must be done on an object. If an object is moving, work is required to bring it to rest. The change in kinetic energy is equal to the work done. So the work energy theorem describes the relationship between work and energy. And again, we abbreviate change in as delta. So work will equal the change in kinetic energy. Right? So work in this equation is equal to the network, that is the work based upon the net force. If there is no change to an object's kinetic energy, then no work was done. If this ball is traveling along at a constant speed at a constant velocity, right, its kinetic energy doesn't change. If I impart a force upon it and change its speed, I'm actually going to change its kinetic energy. If I push against a box on the floor, if it does not slide, then I'm not doing work on the box. The minute that box starts sliding or on a slippy floor where there's no friction, the work of your push times the distance of your push appears as kinetic energy of the box. So the box is going to be gaining some kinetic energy. And you know this if somebody ever pushes something into you and it smacks you in the shin or something like that, right? Because it hurts. And then you end up with that work being done on your bone or your funny bone or a nerve or something like or your toe, right? If there's some friction, the net force of your push minus the frictional force is that multiplied by the distance to create the kinetic energy. So if a box is moving at constant speed in a constant direction, it's mechanical equilibrium, we talked about that before, you're pushing just hard enough to overcome friction. That means the box is not speeding up or slowing down. Network is zero, right? So that means the box is moving at constant speed. It has a constant kinetic energy. If I speed it up or slow it down, I am changing its kinetic energy. So the work theorem also applies to decreasing speed. The more kinetic energy something has, the more work's required to stop it. Twice as much kinetic energy means twice as much work. And due to friction, the energy is transferred both into a floor. Here we're showing a tire stopping, right? So the floor is going to heat up, but also the tire is going to heat up and the brakes are going to heat up. An infrared camera will reveal everything that's kind of heated up on the floor and the tire as you stop a bike from coming at a certain speed. So when a car brakes, the work is done by the friction force applied by the brakes multiplied by the distance over which the force friction acts. Right? So automobile brakes convert kinetic energy into heat, right? Professional drivers are uh, kind of familiar with that and they know other ways to brake from shifting to a low gear, let the energy slow the vehicle. Hybrid cars, right? Know that by braking, you're creating potential energy and it'll store some of that heat and that kinetic energy in the battery to provide more charge to the battery, right? Regenerative braking, it's called. So a car moving at twice the speed of another has four times as much kinetic energy and will require four times as much work to stop because velocity is squared. Kinetic energy equals one half mass velocity squared. If the frictional force is enough nearly the same for both cars, the one takes four times as much distance to stop. So kinetic energy depends upon that speed squared. Here's some typical stopping distance based upon various speeds. And this is cars equipped with anti-lock brakes to keep you from locking up the brakes and not being able to stop it. At about a 45 mile an hour or kilometers per hour, it's about a 10 meter stop. At 90, you're now at 40 meters. If you're going 180 kilometers per hour, it takes you 160 meters in order to come to a complete stop for a normal car. By that time, you've plowed through several other cars if you're traveling that fast. So that's why roadways have certain speeds, is to give you the ability to stop without hitting another car. That's why you also need little space and blah, blah, blah. So kinetic energy often appears as hidden in different forms of energy, such as heat, sound, electricity, 
excuse me, even light, right? Random molecular motion is sensed as heat. I'm sitting here messing with these two balls and I can feel them heating up. Well, why is that? Well, there's some friction going on between my hands. There's some friction going on between the two balls, right? And so some heat is being created because of that friction. Right now, as I speak, my voice is creating sound waves, which is vibrating a certain pattern going from the microphone being transferred, transferred into an electric current that can be recorded for you guys, right? Light causes motion within the atoms. We'll talk about that when we get to the light check. So electrons in motion make electric currents. Let's say you take 100 joules of work on a moving cart. Does that mean the cart will gain 100 joules of kinetic energy? Well, although you do 100 joules of work on the cart, this may not be the, mean the cart gains a full 100 joules. How much kinetic energy the cart gains is depending upon the net work done on it and also the account of friction, right? So when the brakes of a car are locked, the car skids to a stop. How much farther will the car skid if it's moving three times as fast? Well, because again, one half m v squared, right, is our normal formula. If I take v and I make it 3v, I have to square everything inside that. That means that 3 becomes a 9 when I square it, right? So that means that it's actually going to take nine times as far to stop a car traveling three times as fast because of that square. So that leads us to efficiency, which is kind of any machine that we deal with, one of the things we talk about is efficiency. My laptop is sitting here, my desktop I'm building, there's gonna be efficiency levels of those devices, right? My power supply I bought for my new computer I'm building over the side here that you can see in pieces has a certain efficiency. It provides a certain amount of power and a certain amount of power actually goes into the power, the actual computer itself. The higher the efficiency, the better it is at delivering that power, All right? So in any machine, some energy is transferred in atomic molecular energy making the machine warmer. My laptop right now has a certain amount of heat it's giving off, right? So that means efficiency is the ability to use work, useful work output versus our total work output, right? If machines are ideal, those are equal, one-to-one. -one. So if I get useful work, my total work is one, one-to-one -one ratio. But we know that's not true. We know that no machines are 100% efficient. When a simple lever rocks about its fulcrum or a pulley turns around its axis, a small fraction of that energy is going to be converted into thermal energy due to friction. So the efficiency of the machine is a ratio of useful energy output to how much you put into it, right? To convert energy efficiency, you just simply multiply it by 100%, and it tells you what the efficiency of an engine is. An ideal machine would have 100% efficiency. No real, real machine can be 100% efficient. We haven't gotten that far. There's always going to be heat, right? Your engine of your car is not 100% efficient because you're going to do a certain amount of, the car is going to do a certain amount of work to get a certain amount of work output, but they're never going to be equal. You're always going to lose some of that work that your car does to heat. And you can feel that by just putting your hand over the engine and feeling the heat that the engine has. So if we put 100 joules of work on a lever and only get 98 joules out of that, that lever is 98% efficient, right? So joules out, 98 over joules in, 100. That equals 0.98, which is the same as saying 98%. That would be a very good work efficiency, right? If the if pulley system's going and a larger fraction of input energy is lost as to heat, so say we do 100 joules and we only get 40 joules out of it, right? or we lose 40 joules due to heat, at that point, the pulley system has an efficiency of only 60%. So let's look at the new, we're gonna look at a Ford GT Mustang Fastback here, right? With port fuel injected and 460 horsepower and 420 foot pounds of torque, of tire swelling torque, or squealing, I think squealing. I don't know what squealing torque is. You'll never be at a loss for power, right? So this is the engine's rated horsepower. 
So now you put the Mustang on a dynamometer, which is used to measure the horsepower of a vehicle. But you're saddened to see that it only puts down 437 horsepower to the wheels. Wait, but it says that it has 460 horsepower, but it's only putting 437 to the wheels. Well, what's happening? Well, you're losing some of that horsepower to friction, right? You're losing some of that heat to the transfer of energy, right? So all those things are going to come into play, right? So that means that, that Mustang is not as efficient as a, an ideal machine being 100% efficient. Now, are you ever going to get a car that does that? Probably not, never, because friction exists, right? We still haven't developed the perfect polymer oil to prevent reduced friction. We have all kinds of oils that are out there, right? Synthetics are a lot better than our traditional, um, you know, fossil fuel style uh, oils that we used before, right? But we still lose some of that due to friction. As those pistons go up and down in that the piston shafts, it loses some of the energy to friction. So this leads us to the law of conservation of energy. And I have my Optimus Prime up there for a reason, right? We keep running this theory of conservation. We have conservation of momentum in the previous chapters regarding Newton. Now the conservation of energy states that energy cannot be created nor transformed or destroyed, it can only transform. So in the case of that Ford Mustang back there, we're not actually destroying 23 horsepower. What's happening is it's losing 23 of that horsepower due to friction and heat. So it's losing it and it's converting it into heat energy. So we're gonna have 23 joules of heat energy loss, right? So energy can either be created nor destroyed. It only transforms or changes form. More important than knowing what energy is, is understanding how it behaves, how it transforms. We understand that almost every process in nature has some transform of energy to another, right? So potential energy. Here we have Green Arrow pulling back on the bowstring. As he draws back on that bowstring, he's stretching that bow out, right? The bow then gains potential energy. When it's released, that potential energy is to be converted into kinetic energy of the arrow, and it's going to fly off. It's going to deliver that energy then to a target somewhere down the line. Right? The distance the arrow moves multiplied by the average force of the impact doesn't quite matter, add up to the kinetic energy of the target. And you're like, well, wait, why? Well, if you actually look at thermally, the target's a little warmer and the arrowhead is a little warmer because it had lost some due to heat, right? Energy changes from one form to the other without a net loss or net gain. If we can ever find a way to gain electricity, that will solve our energy crisis, but that won't ever happen. Right? Maybe if we ever solve the theory of antimatter and stuff like that, maybe, who knows? So the study of the forms of energy and the transformation of energy from one to another is the law of conservation of energy. For any system in its entirety, as simple as a swinging pendulum or as complex as an exploding galaxy, there is one quantity that doesn't change, energy. Energy may change forms, total energy stays the same. The amount of energy that's in our universe right now has always been in our universe. It's kind of a wild subject to think about, but the amount of energy that's here has always been here and it will always be here. It's just going to change from heat to light to light to energy to stored from potential to kinetic, from kinetic to gravitational. So all of that energy is going to constantly be changing forms. Total energy is always going to stay the same. Wind up cars are a great example of conservation of energy. Part of potential energy of the wound spring converts to kinetic energy. The remaining potential energy gets lost to the heat of the machinery and friction, right? So no energy is really lost per se, it's just changed forms. So we may have started with 10 joules of potential energy, but when we measure it down the road, it may only have eight joules of kinetic energy. Why is that? We lost two joules due to heat. So everywhere along the path of a pendulum bob, the sum of the potential energies and the kinetic energies are gonna be the same because the work done against friction, this energy will eventually be transformed into heat and eventually that pendulum will slow down and stop. So if I pull back on that pendulum, it's going to be 100% potential energy. As it moves through, it's going to be decreasing in potential, increasing kinetic until it's purely kinetic energy. 
And then that kinetic energy is going to change again back to potential as it goes up the other side until it's fully potential energy. It stops. And then once again, it goes back down, right? That's the idea of that pendulum that's in most grandfather clocks that sways back and forth, right? By swaying back and forth, it's creating a certain amount of kinetic energy to allow that clock hand to continue to move around the clock. Sometimes you have to re kind of set that pendulum so that the clock keeps ticking, right? When a person leaps from a burning building, the sum of their potential and kinetic energy remains the same the whole way down. So in this case here, a person has 10,000 joules of potential energy based upon its gravitational potential energy. As she jumps out, whee, at about a quarter of the way down, she's gained about a quarter of that in kinetic energy and it's been converted from potential energy. Halfway down, she's half kinetic, half potential. Three quarters of the way down, she's now more kinetic than more potential. Until she reaches the ground down here, and where all of her energy is now kinetic as she imparts that upon this little trampoline. Now, if that trampoline cannot take a thousand or is it 10,000 joules of kinetic energy and it can only handle, if I say 5,000, she's probably gonna get hurt. She's probably gonna fall right through the trampoline and hit the ground. So it's important to understand how much those trampolines or how much those bouncy calluses or whatever we're gonna have them land on can absorb in kinetic energy. Otherwise, you can end up with an injured person. So every atom that makes up all matter is a concentrated ball of energy, right? When the nuclei of atom arrange themselves, enormous amounts of energy can be released, right? The sun shines because some of its nuclear energy is transformed into radiant energy or light energy. Nuclear reactors, nuclear energy is transformed into heat. Enormous compression due to gravity in the deep, hot interiors of the sun causes hydrogen nuclei to fuse and become helium nuclei. This high fusion temperature wielding of the atomic nucleus is called thermonuclear fusion. This process releases radiant energy, which eventually reaches Earth in the form of the sun rays, right? This energy falls on plants, right? Those plants absorb that energy. Some of them may eventually become fossil fuels like coal or oil, right? Or maybe eaten by animals such as dinosaurs, which may eventually become coal or oil. So another part supports life in the food chain that begins with microscopic marine plants and animals, later gets stored into oil. Part of the sun's energy is used to evaporate water from the ocean. Some of that water returns to the earth as rain and is trapped behind a dam. That water behind the dam gains potential energy, falls down through those sluices, creates electric energy by that gravitational falling energy, travels through wires or homes where it's used to lighting, heating, cooking, operating electric toothbrushes, operating computers, watching Mr. McKeever make an idiot of himself on Zoom talking to himself. So energy for life. There is more energy stored in the molecules of food than there is in the reaction products after the food is metabolized. This energy difference sustains life. Every living cell in every organism is a mini machine. Like any machine, living cells need an energy supply. In metabolism, carbon combines with oxygen to create carbon dioxide. That's why we give off carbon dioxide. So during metabolism, the reaction rate is much slower than the combustion and energy is released as is needed by the body. In AMP and introductory to Therax, you're gonna learn how the body uses energy from food to build adenosine triphosphate, ATP, which is the energy powerhouse of the cells the mighty mitochondria help use in order to sustain life. Only green cell plants and certain one cell organisms can make carbon dioxide combined with water to produce a hydrocarbon compound such as sugar. This process is called photosynthesis, right? This is why plants are good at scrubbing the oxygen and those are scrubbing the air of carbon dioxide and leaving a little bit cleaner air, right? The process photosynthesis requires an energy input, which usually comes from sunlight. Plants grow in sunlight. So green plants use the thermal energy of the sun to make food, and then that plant grows, and maybe you eat the plant to provide you with sustenance, or maybe a cow eats the plant, and because that cow ate the plant, that cow now has some energy, which then gets eaten by us, which provides us with energy. So, but it all stems back to coming from the sun. 
right? Solar power, the sun is practically source of all of our energy on earth, right? Sunlight is directly transformed in electricity by photovoltaic cells. We use the energy in sunlight to generate electricity indirectly as well, right? Sunlight evaporates water, which later falls as rain. Rainwater falls into the rivers and generates turbines returns to the sea. Solar panels look like traditional asphalt shingles, but they're hooked to a home's electrical grid, right? electrical system. Um, and contrary to popular belief, if we put more solar panels up, that does not mean the sun will lose energy. That's not the way any of this works, just to let you know. Wind, right? Wind is caused by unequal warming of Earth's surface. It's another form of solar power, believe it or not. Even though wind exists, its cause is solar. The energy of wind can be used to turn generator turbines within specially equipped windmills, right? And harnessing this wind is practical when the energy is produced for future use, such as the form of hydrogen, right? And here's the big thing, windmills harnessing the wind don't cause cancer, another kind of subject. The sound wow, wow, does not cause cancer. So fuel cells, we can actually use fuel cells to store energy, right? Hydrogen is the least polluting of all fuels because it takes energy to make hydrogen to extract it from water and compounds is not only a source of energy, but can be used as byproduct, right? An electric current can break down water into hydrogen and oxygen called, in a process called electrolysis. If you make the electrolysis process run backwards, you have a fuel cell, right? And we're, in, we're looking at more and more hydrogen powered vehicles, right? To help maybe replace some of our ICE internal combustion engines to help get us off of the fossil fuel standard, right? And a fuel cell hydrogen and oxygen are compressed Electrodes produce water and electric current, which would allow us to use water as a fuel, um, which we may have an abundance of as our polar caps melt. Then we have nuclear and geothermal, right? The most concentrated form of usable energy is stored in uranium and plutonium, which are nuclear fuels, right? So the Earth's interior, the actual core of the Earth, right, is kept hot by producing a form of nuclear power of radioactivity which has been with us since the earth was formed. Now, does that mean it'll always be there? We don't know. Um, it's possible, I guess, that the earth's core could stop, but if that earth's core stops, we're in a lot bigger trouble than worrying about energy at that point. The byproduct of the radioactivity of the earth's interior is geothermal energy, right? It's held in underground reservoirs of hot water. In these places, heated water near the Earth's surface is tapped to provide steam for running turbo generators, right? Fracking, you've probably heard before, right? So dry rock geothermal power is the producer of electricity. Water is put deep into cavities dry, of dry rock. Water turns into steam, reaches a turbine at the surface. After exiting the turbine, it's returned to the cavity for reuse. This is fracking. It may seem innocuous enough and thinking, okay, that's a good source of power. But there are some pretty bad side effects from it that can be damage to the local fault lines and other things like poisoning the environment. Um, picture down below is an actual picture of a woman setting her water line on fire. She turned on her faucet, put a match up to it, and it, the water catches fire. Because there's so much methane now in her water pipes that the water is undrinkable. That's actually up in an area where I'm from in Moscow, Pennsylvania. Um, top of that, the water that we're pumping down through the ground and pumping back up can collect contaminants, which then we have to figure out what to do with that water that we contaminated, right? We get these nasty pools of nasty, crappy water, and then we let that sit, and that seeps into the groundwater and causes all kinds of other problems. So let's look at energy from a PT perspective. Our, requ our patients require energy in order to do any of the exercises we ask them to do. Oftentimes, patients in the hospital seem a lot more fatigued and fatigue quickly and are not able to perform the work that we may ask them to do in the outside world. On top of that, they may not be able to generate the power to lift something as simple as a one pound dumbbell. Well, why could this be? Well, number one, they're injured. So their overall energy stores are down, right? Their body is fighting off whatever the problem is. They probably aren't eating the best, right? So that means that a patient in an inpatient setting is performing at a lower efficiency. Their, their efficiency engine is down compared to what it might be on the outer world. 
right? And we know that humans are not 100% efficient. I can tell that by just feeling myself, right? I have a temperature, right? We put off heat. Some of us put off more heat than others. All right, good news. That's it for this lesson. That is energy and that is kind of looking at Newton. So that's it for these two lessons. Um, we will be reviewing a little bit of this next week on Monday. So other than that, please take a look at the quiz questions that are on each of the lectures. And I wish you all a good day. And I hope to see some fantastic scores from you in anatomy. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you and have a good one.